to everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, roundtable on uh, mapping and support for the remote monitoring in crisis area. And we'll try to see together the opportunities and the constraints uh, with this remote monitoring. So I'm uh, Mary Bickman. I'm the mapping poll coordinator at CARTONG, and I will facilitate this roundtable. So as you maybe know, the humanitarian and development sectors uh, and the GIS did not wait for the current health crisis uh, with the COVID to work with remote monitoring. It's something that we're quite used to. Um, as in crisis area, this remote monitoring is necessary or even essential as it's sometimes the only way we have to access information. Um, the area being just physically inaccessible or presenting high risk. So we have many tools that already um, enable this remote monitoring. And today we will see different uh, use cases in which this remote monitoring has been implemented. And we will try to highlight the opportunities that this approach uh, has offered, but also constraints and biases that we can induce. And for this today, I'm glad to welcome the speakers. So we have uh, Erwan Fiol, who's worked for HACF at developing a early warning system using real-time remote uh, sensing data in West Africa, Sahelian area. And he's now the GIS officer in this uh, area, in charge of the pastoral early warning system, the PUSE, <laughs> uh, used to monitor the pastoral situation throughout uh, the seasons. And uh, he's there with his colleague, Cédric Bernard, uh, who will help also to manage the Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, and uh, Cédric is the uh, Regional Food Security and Livelihood Advisor for SEFQ uh, at the Regional Office for Western and Central Africa. Then we will have Clovis Grinan uh, from Nitidae, uh, who is an expert in land use change monitoring using remote sensing, digital soil mapping, and spatial modeling applied to forestry, agronomy, and landscape ecology. Um, then last, Prosper Mufoya. Uh, unfortunately, he will not be live with us due to some uh, uh, field operational <laughs> movement. Um, so we have a video of his uh, presentation. And last, uh, so worked for MSF and he's the GIS officer in Zimbabwe. And he's helping uh, at providing mapping GIS support for the country, but also for the, the whole region. And we will finish with a presentation from uh, Matthew Wenzel from Impact Initiative, who is Global GIS uh, Manager, experience in different fields, uh, linking together environmental management, urban planning, international development, humanitarian relief, and disaster risk reduction. So that's it for all the speakers. I hope you will enjoy the presentation and just a few logistic aspects before we start. Uh, just to remind you that um, if you have questions that you want to ask for the Q&A at the end, please use the Q&A function that you have on the bottom of the screen. And uh, for the others, you can also take a look at this Q&A and put a thumb up if you like this question. And we will start with the question that have more um, thumb up. <laughs> so I let the floor to Erwan. So thank you, Marie, for the presentation. Uh, yeah, so I'm Erwan Fiol, and from the West and Central Africa Regional Office of uh, Action Against Hunger uh, in Dakar, Senegal. And uh, today, with my colleague uh, Cédric Bernard, I'm presenting you the pastoral early warning system used by ACF in uh, the Sahel area. Yeah, so for technical reasons, um, the presentation is recorded because my connection is not uh, that good. So yes, please, Mary, if you can send the presentation now. Good. The pastoral early warning system in the Sahel. A brief context, um, West African Sahel, it's a large territories uh, and with a very uh, low windfall. And, um, and low vegetation with high seasonality uh, of vegetation due to the West African motion. 
Um, and pastoralism inside uh, is an extensive kind of breeding um, with transhumanist movements uh, along season in order to optimize uh, the resources in uh, pasture and water. And it play a very important key role uh, in social and economic activities. But obviously, it's highly dependent on terms of resources in pasture and water. A brief historical of the pews uh, uh, is to, in 2003 2005 in North Mali, where that we start to, use, to design this kind of system. But it is in 2007 that we use in a regular uh, basis uh, uh, remote sensing data to estimate and assess the quantity of pasture available um, with different improvements during the, the year after years and um, how does it work? Um, the two resources followed are the, the water and the, the biomass um, using uh, both uh, satellite imageries and uh, data collected from the field. Um, to feed up the pure system, this can analyze all those data in order to provide some information directly to the breeders or to the international organizations. So in terms of uh, remote sensing uh, data, um, we use a series of uh, satellites uh, from spot vegetation in 1998, uh, replaced in 2014 by Proba-V, and uh, replaced uh, right now by Sentinel-3 in October to, uh, 2020. And the products uh, we use are um, mainly the DMP for dry matter productivity and uh, the SWB uh, for small water bodies. Both are accessible at uh, one, kilometers, uh, one kilometer of resolution on uh, 10 days uh, basis, temporal basis. This is a kind of maps uh, provided by the system. Uh, this is um, the biomass anomaly of production for the current uh, year, for the current uh, rainy season. Uh, we can see that it is uh, positive uh, uh, of uh, the wool area. It is uh, 2020. It's a very exceptional year in terms of rainfall and biomass production. Uh, if we focus on an area, the system can provide in the real time this kind of profile, um, which are the biomass production. Um, and we can see that it starts right on time, but uh, on, on a very high level. And it, it was uh, far um, ab um, above uh, the, the normal uh, rate, which is uh, symbolized by this uh, thin uh, line. And uh, for uh, the total uh, production of a uh, GAO, it's uh, uh, far above um, the, the normal, uh, which was the case as well for the two last years since uh, 2018. Uh, uh, it was a positive um, production there. Um, if we compare the situation of 2020 with the situation of the last year, 2019, uh, it was uh, more critical, especially on the West area uh, in Mauritania and Senegal. And we experiment uh, on the last dry season uh, a difficult uh, anger gap uh, there. Uh, the system provides as well some information about um, uh, surface water accessibility, as uh, this is the anomaly of surface water accessibility uh, calculated for the months of uh, August and September. Um, and we can see in blue uh, where the surface, uh, um, surface water is more accessible than the normal in red, where the surface water is less accessible than the normal. And the system permits as well to uh, to follow the, the filling rate uh, in real time of uh, the different uh, reservoirs or ponds. Uh, for instance, for Mboot in Mauritania, we can see that uh, uh, the situation of uh, filling, it was uh, quite normal, a uh, little bit ab above the, the normal. And uh, for um, Amastalakad uh, in Gao, uh, Mali, the, 
the non-permanent pound uh, start to fill up a little bit late, but with a, a very high rate. Uh, so there, the situation is quite positive as well for water. But some information are not uh, accessible from space, obviously. So uh, for those one, we use um, uh, some relays, uh, meaning some people dispatched on all the t territories uh, to uh, who we send some um, questionnaires uh, using a, an automated system, uh, using a, a software called Telerivet, we send some SMS and we receive the answer to the questionnaire. Um, and after processing, uh, we can provide some maps or data information to, to fit up some QGIS project. Uh, the questionnaire is it's about uh, the pasture uh, disponibility in terms of quantity and quality and uh, the water accessibility. Uh, uh, for the wheels, uh, for instance, uh, the price to access the wheels, um, and about animal uh, concentration and movements, and animal health, uh, if there is some epidemic or abnormal uh, mortality, and uh, as well if there is some conflict. And we collect as well some uh, market price, uh, about uh, the price for uh, animal. Uh, um, and uh, during the, the COVID-19 um, crisis, we collect some additional indicators uh, about uh, the disruption of the economic activities and uh, if there is some um, closure of markets or shortage uh, for essential um, uh, items such as uh, sugar or soap. Uh, and if there is some abnormal increase in number of patients in the medical centers. And this information uh, is uh, used to feed a web accessible uh, dashboard uh, where we uh, is for the COVID uh, situation. Um, this is uh, for the month of October. It's um, uh, the dashboard is um, um, updated each uh, each week with uh, new uh, new data. And uh, for the for the month for October, we can see the situation is quite normal. But if we um, getting back uh, at the higher peak of the um, of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, middle of uh, month of May, uh, we can see that there is some uh, uh, tension uh, around uh, water points, especially at the border of Mauritania and Senegal and, and Mali, uh, because of the restriction of movement. There is some redu reduction of movement as well uh, uh, in the region of the three borders, uh, around Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali, and uh, some shortage uh, of sugar and soap uh, in the region of the, of the Black Chad. Now about the major constraints we um, we face it. It's uh, more uh, a term of uh, coverage and uh, how we can we reach uh, the uh, the relays and to send uh, the questionnaires um, because uh, the coverage in um, in internet and in even on mobile phone is not uh, perfect on the area and so we experiment some some gap in in, in the filling the system and some you long latency uh, between the uh, the sending of the questionnaire and the answer uh, by the relay uh, the other major constraints is about um, accessibility of uh, the products uh, uh, delivered uh, by the Copernicus uh, um, service uh, and uh, because of the swap from Probavi to, to Sentinel-3 there is an interruption of the, of the products that we are used to use uh, such as DMP um, uh, which is replaced by a new version of the DMP but we find out that there is a huge difference between the, those two versions um, and uh, and it affects uh, the quality of the system and um, 
and for the SWB about uh, the surface water, um, they just uh, um, stop the production of the SWB one kilometer to be replaced by a new version at 20 meter. But at our sense, um, the link between those two products is uh, almost impossible because uh, they are very uh, so uh, different in terms of uh, spatial coverage and uh, temporal. Uh, um, the frequency as well. Um, so thank you. If you get any question. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for the video. <laughs> we will we will go for question uh, at the end. Um, and so now I let the floor to Clovis. Thank you. Hello everyone. It works. Let me know. All good. Thanks. All right. Um, so thanks for letting me the opportunity to to present to you some experience from Niti Day. Um, but first, uh, give you some um, information on Niti Day. So it's a French NGO uh, that. Mission is to design, develop, and implement projects uh, regarding uh, natural resource conservation and rural uh, economy development. Uh, basically, this uh, small, uh, or average uh, NGO of uh, hundreds of collaborators um, that intervene in uh, implement middle-term project in partnership in several African countries, especially. With, uh, with uh, office and and um, and a development project in Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Mali, and uh, Mozambique and Madagascar. Um, today, I present uh, some of the practical case from uh, a, a, a environmental and geospatial unit within the Niti Day that uh, is specialized in land uh, use change monitoring and impact evaluation. Uh, for the, the uh, Niti Day's action or, 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 or to a larger scale. So basically we we do uh, within this unique uh, user observation, observation uh, field inventories and, and the data uh, collection from the film to to develop three type of, um, of uh, studies or of action. So, uh, and I will review them quickly now uh, regarding uh, land use and land change baseline, uh, how we use uh, mapping as a support for the intervention on the film and uh, some case on uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, so, um, as a first uh, uh, information, so we're not uh, in an emergency uh, application, but more on a, on a development project. And uh, geospatial information is also a uh, very uh, it's mandatory or uh, very uh, powerful tool to to um, to uh, support all the the all action. So uh, here's the, a quick overview of of, um, of the the scale uh, first uh, of uh, actions uh, from a village to country scale, uh, either to provide uh, application on a on first um, baseline on a diagnosis uh, regarding. Uh, a, a various panel of uh, socio-economical and en environmental indicators uh, to provide uh, and to design intervention uh, on hotspot uh, and um, and uh, finely tune the the, the, the the actions and uh, more on the uh, longer time frame uh, to uh, discuss with uh, local authorities and uh, various stakeholders to to develop some land use plan uh, reports, uh, changes uh, along the years, or uh, develop long-term strategy or, or land use policy. Uh, so uh, a first case I wanted to share with you is to do uh, some of the studies we're doing uh, at national scale here in Mozambique, uh, combining uh, large time series analysis uh, from a vegetation index um, along the years, combined with uh, land cover and the uh, land use uh, maps. So um, this uh, enable us to, to have an historical uh, trajectories 
of the last 10 to 20 years uh, regarding uh, change factor or potential change factors, deforestation, but also uh, agricultural uh, productive decline, uh, uh, activities on the grasslands and uh, other uh, ecosystem uh, dynamics. So this has application on the national scale for designing uh, what we call a land degradation baseline or policy targets to uh, mitigate the degradation of land, but also at a local scale to, to define, a, uh, to identify uh, hot spots of, of, um, of land um, degradation uh, as a general, general term. And using the same approach, uh, basically uh, of remote sensing and combining information, uh, we also can we can also uh, look at the positive trends. So whether the, the regrowth, uh, tree planting, uh, increase of uh, grass uh, grassland productivity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, with uh, various scales of application. Um, another uh, regional scale approach to to document uh, states uh, of the land use at a a project start to, to understand the, the patterns and the, the landscape is to, to develop a land use change, land use maps. And uh, we can benefit from the recent uh, satellite imagery to have a very recent image at a very fine resolution here and, and uh, develop large scale maps here uh, covering several uh, one, uh, communes or uh, circle in, in Mali. Uh, to um, in a, in a world map, and that also integrates various sources of data, not only um, uh, plot observation using GPS, but also open street map data and a population data set at uh, from other data provider, and a field data collection to to ground truth or and to to uh, document also the the database of, of land use map. Uh, another practical case uh, using maps uh, to support interventions is to uh, locate uh, vegetation change here, uh, focusing uh, especially on deforestation mapping. So um, very based based also in the in intra annual uh, remote sensing imagery, and uh, we can um, use uh, those um, information to, uh, and. Uh, and uh, new tools uh, to, to uh, which is basically early warning system of uh, deforestation to uh, provide information to, to uh, lo local uh, technician and uh, eco rangers to uh, do uh, to, to their patrols and uh, check and make observation on the on, on the, uh, the observation from the satellites. So this. Um, some cases are related to, to deforestation, but we also monitor uh, in, a, in a weeks and a, or less than a month uh, changes on the ground that uh, are related to, to uh, agricultural practices, either for um, uh, planting or other uh, factors that need to be uh, checked on the field and, and uh, improve our, our efficiency also. Uh, of the activities on the field. Um, in terms of support to the to the to those projects, uh, we are uh, working with uh, local communities to to do some land use uh, plan uh, to uh, anticipate and to uh, gather um, uh, knowledge on on the uh, at the village or, or upper scale. To, um, to for the the futures uh, of the and and do some uh, rules uh, at the local for the local meet, local community. So uh, this come up um, with uh, lots of uh, ground uh, measurements using ODK or other mobile data collection, and uh, also um, make the use of very high resolution images to to uh, delineate the actual. Uh, landscape and um, and land use to to uh, triggers uh, discussion on the on the futures of those villages um, and uh, another uh, task or, or support we provide to the, the projects is to gather all those information 
from uh, for the act the related to the activities and the special indicators that are relevant for the project to in a GIS and uh, make them more accessible for, for all the partners or, uh, and stakeholders uh, through a geo portal. So we are using open open source and and, and um, open data framework to to make the the, the information accessible uh, to the to the most uh, larger panel. So uh, here's a brief and a quick overview of an of example of mapping. Uh, and so just uh, to finish with uh, some thoughts uh, regarding opportunities and constraints. Um, I think we are all now in the, in the, especially in the recent few years, uh, we, uh, uh, we saw that the, uh, the new satellite imagery and spatial data set with uh, uh, added values such as uh, biomass or, or, or soil water uh, moisture and the various uh, uh, socio uh, ecological uh, indicators that are made available to the to the um, to, to, to various to the users uh, in an unprecedented manner so as an example it's it's, it's now possible to have uh, images from the few days ago uh, free of charge in at, uh, at uh, 10 meters or less resolution and to extract uh, information in, in seconds using um, what uh, we has been presented earlier, uh, imagery from uh, European space agencies and also uh, uh, processing platforms such as Google Earth Engine that uh, enable us to, to really get instant access to, 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 to such indicators. But uh, so as an example, you, you must know, and uh, this has been used for emergency uh, action, the, the Facebook and with the Columbia University produced a, a very high resolution population data set, uh, which is uh, very uh, robust uh, to detect uh, houses at a, at a pixel level and, and to uh, uh, disaggregate population census and uh, information on the count of people, but also uh, other uh, demographic indicators, um, women's, infants, and and uh, by age, uh, to to uh, in in a um, timely manner. So I recently been produced and um, uh, for for 2015, but it's expected to be updated regularly. Uh, there's another uh, recent initiative called uh, the with the planet imagery that uh, provide the uh, image at three meter resolution on a daily basis that's uh, gonna really revolutionize also our way to our map mapping mapping the the, the 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 land and the monitoring changes and uh, another uh, example on on, uh, on forestry but uh, so this is really a recent publication uh, that uh, showed that it's possible uh, it's gonna be possible to map individual trees uh, in the in a shorter term but so we, we see that all those uh, uh, index or, or, or raw image um, uh, can be uh, made accessible but uh, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, we, we will have a, a consistent knowledge of what's going on on the on the ground and and design appropriate action so this is a, some kind of takeaway message uh, here, but uh, very uh, pretty obvious. And uh, but uh, we cannot uh, see everything from a um, remote sensing. Um, lots of those uh, index or indicators are derived from models, but they will always need calibration and validation from ground management. Uh, it's uh, not because the, the the maps looks pretty that uh, it means it's accurate. Uh, local knowledge will all, and, and cross checking, cross analyzing the information will always be necessary. Um, and especially to interpret the drivers of change, uh, which, um, which not uh, appears on, on the, from remote sensing. And uh, more general thoughts uh, to, um, it's not uh, because you have the information that you're using uh, and especially uh, in, um, uh, we're working in deforestation in Ivory Coast, and it's it's pretty obvious that in the 
the next few years, uh, the, 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 the intact forest will disappear uh, and uh, it's on, on all um, geoportals. Uh, but uh, the, the, the fact that information is there but not used, uh, for, for it means that the, the culture of using and uh, the information is not there and need to be enhanced. Uh, also uh, on the information management uh, side. And basically, uh, we, we may uh, need to change of, and shift of paradigm to, 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 to not providing uh, those information to, to local stakeholders, but to develop and, and produce the information with uh, for adoption and, and, uh, and uh, create ownership. Thank you for your listening. Thanks a lot, Clovis. Um, now we will continue with a presentation from last uh, prospect from MSF. Um, so it will be um, a recorded video. So Oid, I will let you launch it. Is it working now? Hello, my name is Lars Postom Foyer. I'm the GI specialist for MSF OCB. I'll be making a presentation on um, my involvement in the this intervention for the Cyclone Idai disaster, which occurred in Zimbabwe, 2018-2019. Uh, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, the cyclone we affected uh, Malawi, Mozambique, as well as Zimbabwe, and affected about more than a quarter million uh, people in Zimbabwe. Uh, about 17 households were affected, families were left homeless, and um, a number of schools were actually damaged uh, beyond repair and destroyed, basically. So MSF, being a humanitarian organization, was one of the first to respond, if not the first, to, to respond to the emergency. And this is what led to uh, GIS, uh, the use of GIS mapping to support the whole uh, intervention process both uh, in, internally as well as externally. Uh, like uh, the, the maps that we proceed by naturally by being one of the first organizations to actually uh, respond, we I was able to develop maps that were basically used uh, not only by MSF by, but also by 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 other organizations uh, out uh, beside MSF. And this helped us to, to, to strategize and uh, our intervention and response. So the challenges that we faced uh, in the field uh, in, in, in which prompted us to, uh, to, to, to innovate was basically that the, the disaster had destroyed, made ensure that they were inaccessible roads as well as bridges. And there was limited communication channels like uh, you, there was a limited cell phone network coverage and uh, internet, natural internet, so as internet connectivity was low in many parts. And uh, to top it off, there was uh, limited area knowledge by the response team that was basically responding. As MSF, we had three, we had three offices and three, three, three offices that were responding to, to, to the disaster. Uh, and as for myself, I was based here in the, uh, in the Harare office, which is basically about 300. 300, uh, 400, four, excuse me, 400 kilometers away uh, from the disaster site, which is Chipping and Chimani Mani. So the teams were responding to this to the disaster in this area. So it was quite a challenge. Uh, it was a that it was a logistical decision basically that was taken in order to to ensure, considering that the. the the, the, the zones in the in the, the area had had been affected. There was basically no electricity and no communication. So we had to support remotely and to send data and all necessary documents uh, like maps to the team uh, from uh, remotely. So we had to use this also to monitor uh, the, 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 the progress also that was being taken by the team as well as uh, advising which 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 uh, strategy to 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 employ, uh, considering the, the the results that we're getting from the maps that we we're developing. So 
data that we were using was basically mainly coming from multiple sources such as uh, social media reports from the people that were probably uh, in the disaster zones. And these were basically we victims as well as witnesses uh, of, of, of the disaster. Uh, their accounts, their witness reports uh, that were being sent through that were flying over. Social media was awash with such reports. So we had to take these reports and try to di- di- to, 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 di- to put them on a diagram, on a map, basically, to visualize where these reports were, georeference all these reports. Uh, and in order to do that, we also had to employ participatory mapping since there was limited data. Uh, as OpenStreetMap community also had helped us to digitize uh, settlements as well as the road network. But for specific uh, location and settlement names, we had also employed participatory mapping by seeking uh, guidance from uh, individuals with uh, local area knowledge. Then after having produced these maps, we were able to send them to the team, uh, to the teams uh, outside uh, in the field. And um, it was quite uh, an achievement in that at the end of the day, we were able to have a very efficient response time to the to the to the disaster, as we were the first uh, organization uh, to to set foot in the disaster zone, uh, in the in the heart of the disaster that is in that is in Chimani Mani Township, which was the hardest hit. Uh, then uh, we were able to make informed decisions because at the end of the day they had uh, an overview of. The, the 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 situation all around the rest of the district and this data were kept coming in and we kept updating uh periodically daily and which with each with each change uh, the team was also able to re-strategize and make informed decisions this was quite a pragmatic approach um, and helped the team to achieve um, satisfactory results uh in the field uh, so just a typical example of some of the, the, the outcomes, the maps. Uh, this was developed from the reports that were received uh, from the authorities as well as some social media reports, uh, which was basically trying to depict the disaster zones and the casualties uh, and trying to train to follow um, on any... Uh, the statistics on what, what, what the current situation on the ground is. So this was one of the maps that was, and such a map was sent through to the team in the field, and they were able to 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 reallocate to allocate resources to see which is the best uh, intervention site and which where are they resources needed the most uh, in the field. And uh, it was quite helpful and uh, decisions where you could make informed decisions with such with such an updated tool. Um, another typical example was the road access routes. So basically, this is, I would say, the red roads was the main road that had been, that was, that was basically the normal route that one would use if all things were equal. But unfortunately, there were a few bridges that had been destroyed along this route. So you had to find alternative means in order to, to, to cross uh, into in order to get to this point, which is uh, which was the hardest hit area, uh, which is Chimani Mani Township. So the team had to find an alternative route, and with those uh, uh, community reports as well as some uh, aid from other individuals uh, who aided us, in, uh, they were able to 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 identify also a possible route which would be used by the team uh and uh basically that's the one which they 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 they, they, they which was uh, eventually found out to be accessible and uh well, fortunately enough it was uh it was validated to be true and the team had to could actually access uh the into money money uh, uh as they were the first team basically to access the the town so this was the map uh, after a few days uh, after uh, this road had been reopened and some alternative routes had been created. But initially, this one was the one which was to the left. This one was the one that had uh, 
that had uh, almost first hand information of, of the first scenario just after the just after the disaster struck. So it's a continuous process. We're continually updating this map and sending them to 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 our partners as well as the team in the field, uh, and they were able to keep on uh, having an awareness of the the situation outside and whichever route they who they would also find how they could easily design uh, their movement plans and find out which how they could uh, get to some point if there were any areas intervention site that needed help which they had not yet gone to so this is how the tool basically helped uh, all this support was given to the team uh, remotely and uh, the team was able to to drive using these tools so I'll just focus on two 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 processes which which we made use of by during the uh, remote mapping uh, initiative. So one would make use of reports from the on-site community. Uh, these people were basically this was we in this process we basically relying on individuals or victims, uh, disaster victims who were actually inside the inside the disaster zone. So these were affected. The way these had basically the first hand information of what was the situation inside uh, the the town, inside the disaster zones, and where exactly uh, they were, uh, and the amount of damage that had been, the amount of damage that was there. So we will we time the most social media basically was awash with such reports and. They were just general. Then we had to pick pick uh, the damage uh, that was stated inside. Then validate, verify. Probably they would have two or more reports reporting the same thing for a particular area. Then you'd use that as a validation criteria to to pinpoint and then uh, assessing the road condition. This was done. There was already a, 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 an association of uh, four by four drivers, a drivers community, which was going around the district. Uh, distributing aid and uh, which was basically made up of four by four drivers and these are GPS loggers and they would periodically send their data to me and I would add that to the map and data was received also this WhatsApp the general WhatsApp location which was quite interesting because I realized that most people are not so familiar with the uh, other tools such as Cobo Collect etc but many people had WhatsApp so basically they would send it was basically an opportunity which we realized and there were some you know, well vexed people with go people well vexed with Google Earth and some of them uh, with also uh, I had an individual who was supporting me as well remotely went uh, where the farm there so they kind of knew the area so he would send me also the KML files of uh, the reports that he was saying receiving and this basically would add them onto one map and yeah we would send that data to, to the team in the field. So the participatory mapping now, this was basically to aid in the data that we're receiving from the community, the reports, in order to geocode the reports that we were receiving, we had to make use of participatory mapping in the office. Like I was, I mentioned, I was about 440 kilometers away from the site. So I would then engage with uh, individuals with uh, local area knowledge, and uh, we would sit together and I would present my satellite, ima satellite imagery or even Google Earth. Then we'd work together as he pinpointed the locations uh, that had been stated in the voice recordings or any report that had been received. Uh, and this helped her to identify settlements and the place names since the area was sparsely mapped. So, yeah, this, um, this helped us to improve the amount of data, geospatial data available for the area. Um, so I realized one constraint with this was that you, the, the, the map, the images that we're making use of was very old, were very old, and this process basically requires you want to have a bit up-to-date uh, image, a reference, reference data at least, which which the other party can actually make use of and work, work with uh, to make this process a bit... A bit um, a bit uh, comprehensive and to have success, high success rate, uh, because usually the people are not so geo geo aware. So it it pay, helps to have uh, a bit 
more recent uh, maps and satellite imagery as reference. So lessons and takeaways uh, as a GI specialist uh, and located remotely, I was re receiving a high volume of data very often. And at the end of the day, after you merge up all this data together, you would have an overview of the whole situation and context. Uh, unlike in the field where you would probably be locked up your own corner. Then most importantly, there was direct uh, exposure. There was we avoid the direct exposure to danger. Like in this case, there were a few issues, uh, the rain, the landslides, etc. And what the outcomes of the to what we had was we we were able to actually share data with multiple partners and organizations, and uh, this was quite helpful because it was a joint venture. And like I mentioned before, we realized that WhatsApp is basically one tool that probably could help in at, in in a, at low level data sharing, uh, location data sharing. If you can't implement, if you have no time to implement uh, conventional or mobile data collection toolkits, then it's because like the constraints you would have to train uh, data collection techniques for community volunteers which you would work with. And at times the constraint would be a lack of internet connectivity for some areas. Then you would need also to prove check some of the data that you had been supplied with, for especially that come from the community. For me, I would have to listen to probably, I would have to have a report maybe twice or thrice, or maybe just verify with the authorities. Uh, yeah. Then sometimes accessing uh, specific data or village names it was quite difficult. Some people would only be limited to the amount of uh, local area knowledge that a person has. So this was quite a challenge at times. So yeah, basically that's my account uh, and uh, I hope uh, it could aid to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I will thank last, even if it's not there <laughs> with us. Um, so we will not, unfortunately, we will not be able to ask direct question to last. But if it's his presentation raised some question in your mind and that you think that others from other speakers can can answer it, don't hesitate also to put it in the Q and A. And we will uh, now finish with uh, Matthew. Thanks, Marie. Let me just share my screen quickly. Okay, so as Marie mentioned at the outset, we do have um, quite a history of remote monitoring. And due to the nature of the context in which we work, um, we've had to develop and rely on approaches for remote monitoring, typically due to insecurity. However, there are contexts in which we've historically had direct or physical access where we conduct household interviews, where physical infrastructure can be mapped in detail. And in many of the monitoring exercises of hard to reach areas, we also reply on, rely on in-person interviews. And now we've had to adapt to additional access issues as a result of COVID-19 on top of the normal access issues. So we're addressing these challenges through A, the, the adaptation of data collection methodologies and through greater reliance on remote sensing. In terms of adaptation, um, there are a number of things being tried to essentially replace in-person data collection. And so far the most common adaptation is to switch to phone-based surveys where we can. Uh, this is within the originally planned methodology. But some teams have had to reconsider completely their research design and change the, the method entirely. And then for large-scale exercises like multi-sector needs assessment where we depend on representative household surveys, uh, we've been uh, recommending that we switch to quota sampling as, uh, as a preferred alternative when we know that we won't uh, meet the, the targets. And there's been a number of innovative approaches that are being piloted currently, a two-stage approach, for instance, where we're trying to limit field exposure of enumerators, a neighborhood method where we ask key informants household level indicators that correspond to perhaps the nearest five or 10 households, uh, we're also looking at respondent driven sampling as well as uh, some initial pilots with random digit dialing. And for qualitative data collection like focus group discussions, we're sort of splitting in two different directions. We're, we're looking at individual 
uh, interviews that we can uh, make a composite of, and as well as looking at facilitating online group discussions where we can. Since the focus is on mapping, uh, I'd like to focus on our Iraq camp infrastructure mapping project. Uh, and this is something that we've been doing for several years now. And historically, we've had physical access to the camps in northern Iraq. And the typical workflow, which is pretty straightforward, we would meet with the camp manager to get an overview of any changes, uh, which is about a 30 minute discussion. And this would be followed by field data collection uh, with GPS or a COBO form to map any key infrastructure changes. So within three hours, we would essentially conduct a key informant interview and uh, map any key infrastructure changes that are, that are visually confirmed in the field and recorded. And the, uh, the new workflow is, since we've lost access, is essentially a one hour in-depth call uh, with camp management via Zoom, Skype, et cetera, to gain as detailed an understanding of changes as possible. Um, we do share markups of previous camp maps and we're leveraging satellite imagery, which we often do uh, anyway, to verify camp changes. And ultimately, we expect the map outputs to be little affected, largely due to the long history of mapping well-established camps in Iraq. However, the process is clearly less uh, rigorous without the ground truthing component. Uh, and we're facing some challenges in maintaining contact with a small number of camp managers. And so again, we expect to rely more on remote sensing going forward to provide us with confirmation of infrastructure changes. But any lost contact with camp management will have an impact uh, on the ability to camp, capture changes that are, that are smaller, uh, that we can't see from above. And so this is the classic camp infrastructure map in, in Iraq. And it looks like the one that came before it and the one after it will look the same. But the, with the loss of access uh, and especially loss of communication with camp management, there's a, there's a really good chance that small gaps can start to appear in the camp mapping. And I highlighted Iraq because it's the it's essentially the easiest context that we do camp uh, infrastructure mapping. And so most other contexts, there's uh, additional challenges. We're unfamiliar with with sites. There's new sites. There's no established key informant network, um, or there's no history of of direct access. And these challenges challenges are just magnified in these sites. And so. Essentially, we'll be looking at leveraging remote sensing as much as we can, as well as perhaps exploring other methodology, uh, perhaps collaborative or participatory methods for, for mapping infrastructure changes. And so now I'd like to shift to our greater uh, investment in remote sensing. So since the outset of the REACH initiative, we've been leveraging remote sensing, but I can say that it's always been somewhat supplemental or peripheral to what we do. And so over the past couple of years, we've been seeking to leverage remote sensing more extensively. And this has become even more relevant in light of COVID-19. So there are a number of things we're exploring, but today I'll highlight a few thematic areas, uh, mapping displacement in inaccessible areas, uh, trying to develop some cluster specific approaches and an ever increasing focus on preparedness. Um, for a case study of mapping displacement, um, in Syria, we've been looking at shelter identification with remote sensing. And we've been involved in monitoring the Syria crisis for several years now. And we have actually leveraged remote sensing in Syria more extensively than in other contexts, notably for uh, large scale urban damage assessments. However, with the worsening situation in the Northwest, um, it was quite urgent that we try to understand the displacement dynamics and get a sense of population uh, as quickly as we could. And recent assessment exercises rely on key informants to provide updates on IDP numbers and locations, which have uh, fairly obvious limitations. And sometimes the reports can be rather dubious. And so the aim with this was to rapidly analyze fairly large swaths of territory to identify large uh, IDP settlements, uh, individual shelter counts, and then get a sense of, of the current population. And so this is an example of one of the outputs from the key informant uh, interviews and mapping. And so you can see a sense of scale, number of sites per locality, uh, and you can get a sense of the severity. But when you zoom in, uh, it's very difficult to, to validate all of the, the key informant findings. And so earlier this year, 
there was uh, a lot of population movement and we, we weren't able to capture this very well through key informant information. So we decided to look in detail at the satellite imagery. And typically what we do with uh, both internally and with our partners at UNISAT is a, a very detailed manual analysis process. So that's an analyst sitting and counting individual shelters. But in an effort to speed up the process, what you see here is an example of settlement delineation. And so uh, in yellow, you can see the delineation of settlements as of uh, November, 2019. And the red delineations are the, the settlement expansions in just a few months time. And so we decided with, with uh, the ongoing situation that we would try to do a more rapid count of, of shelters. And as we didn't have time to do the detailed manual analysis, um, we started to use uh, Pictera, uh, who consequently I met at GEOG two years ago. So we used their platform to automatically detect shelters, which was um, able to facilitate much faster mapping. And it just required a short uh, quality assurance process to review and edit some small changes, but we're able to analyze these territories much faster. And here's another example of uh, shelter level analysis, but you can see the, the clear expansion from the previous settlements. Um, so shifting to some of the cluster specific approaches, there's been a growing interest in exploring remote sensing opportunities that can pair with potential cluster specific indicators. Uh, in Iraq, uh, we've been supporting the WASH cluster for quite some time, and we've started to look at water related applications of remote sensing. And in Nigeria, we've been looking at recent trends in agricultural activity to see if better linkages can be made with food security and livelihoods indicators. And here's an example of essentially water availability over the, the recent decades in, in Iraq. Uh, this is uh, quite available data. Um, and then we've looked at urban flooding hotspots over the past uh, year or two. And I think what's more interesting is to try to look at um, elements of water quality. And so this is uh, some examples from Basra, which is a city of canals. And so we started looking in at the canals to see what we can identify with imagery. And you can quite easily map the extents of um, trash effectively. And you can also see algal blooms uh, in, the, in the canals as well. So we have a, a pretty good mapping exercise of the, the condition of uh, the canals in Basra. And I think the, the, an area that shows some promise is looking at other measures of, of water. Um, this is an example of the upper Euphrates uh, where we looked at turbidity and you can see in red some hot spots that, that uh, reveal themselves. And these seem to corroborate findings from a district level assessment that we have. And so one of the issues that we're faced with is how can we adjust some of the indicators we use in primary data collection exercise to better match some of the remote sensing data that we have. And so I think we, we're starting some ongoing discussions with uh, both remote sensing colleagues and uh, assessment colleagues on how better how to match these, uh, these two things. And looking at food security and livelihoods in Nigeria, Similarly, we wanted to see what we could find that, that lines up with some of the food security and livelihoods indicators. And is there anything that we can find that corroborates some of the findings? And simply looking at, at both agricultural presence over the recent years, it's quite clear that we can, we can get a sense of the changes that, that align with some of the um, key informant interviews that we have. And we see very clear patterns of uh, increase and decrease in land, and this can be generalized to the to the LGA level. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we found a very strong correlation at the state level between conflict incidents uh, from the ACLED data set and the total amount of agricultural area in the state. And so at this point, we've, we've gotten some interesting findings, but it's just scratching the surface. We need to dig a bit deeper, uh, look for better ways to ask questions that align with the, what we can see with remote sensing data. And then, especially related, related to, to conflict, try to unpack that a bit more uh, and dig deeper to look for um, some better understanding of, of the conflict picture. And then moving on to our increasing focus on preparedness. So in a number of places we work, uh, we see regular, almost seasonal uh, flood impacts, uh, sometimes in the winter. 
uh, and camps and sites. And so through our partners, uh, uh, Shelter Cluster and CCCM, we've been looking at uh, different ways for being prepared for these, these impacts and challenges. And so we've been looking at flood susceptibility in Yemen, and this is with um, all freely avail available data sets. And the rationale being that a number of what's a number of data sets that are out there from UNEP Grid or Think Hazard uh, prepare data sets that are at such a low resolution, they don't provide anything operational for cluster partners in the field to use to make decisions about sites. So uh, going through uh, these available data sets and a workflow that is largely reliant on Google Earth Engine, we're able to come up with um, very good government, governor at level flood susceptibility maps that we can use for uh, site level susceptibility. And in Central African Republic, it, we've, we've taken this exact same method from Yemen and adapted it to the car con context and tried to expand to incorporate some elements of risk as well. And so we have the same essentially flood susceptibility map uh, but we've done some detailed site mapping uh, where we've used the Pitair application to trace uh, the shelter footprints of the sites. And so you can see that in the, the inset in the upper right, uh, there's the same susceptibility map. But unfortunately, the scale of or the resolution of the susceptibility mapping still isn't suitable for internal site level decisions. So we, we know that the sites are perhaps located in a region that's more susceptible, but it's not enough to make any decisions about changes at the camp level. And so this is what's taken us to look at more detailed hydraulic modeling. And so fortunately we were able to obtain a very high resolution digital elevation model in uh, a portion of Dana, uh, the Northern half of the, the uh, Dana sub-district in Syria. And it captured the entire catchment area. And so, with this, we were able to create a digital terrain model and also input this into an application called HECGRASS, which is used for hydraulic modeling. And so we have the terrain, the flow area, and additional model inputs like land use and roughness, which lead to a very uh, high resolution flood hazard classification for areas of uh, the camps. And so you can see an example here of Atma camp in Syria. And this in combination with digitized uh, shelter footprints give you a very clear picture of the shelters that are exposed to flood ha hazard areas. In this case, 814. And so basically I think we're, because of the access issues we're faced with, because of what we're seeing in terms of uh, results from initial forays with other applications of remote sensing, there's gonna be a greater push um, for this whole package of flood susceptibility, uh, detailed uh, digitization from imagery of camps and shelters and infrastructure, and this hydraulic modeling. And that is all I have prepared for today. Thank Thanks, Matthew. Um, just quickly, I see that we have a question related to your presentation, so maybe we can uh, just answer it uh, now. Uh, so Anna asked um, the, if you can repeat the name of the tools that was used for the semi-automatic detection of shelters in North. Oh, State. sure. It's called uh, Pictera, and I can type it in. Thanks. Um, so thanks a lot to all of you. Um, so I'm looking a bit at the Q&A, and so we have... Uh, it's more a remark than a question. Uh, so Sylvie would say that uh, refugees could also be the data collector and might be uh, able to load the camp changes into SM, for instance. But she said that you mentioned it <laughs> during your presentation. Uh, and a question from Edith. Uh, when needed, how do you get the high resolution images? Do you have partnerships uh, for the purchase? So this questions uh, can be answered, I think, but by uh, several of you, as uh, nearly everyone used satellite imagery. So I let the floor to who wants to speak. I mean, in, in our case, I think the, we definitely benefit by, by two key partnerships. So the, the US State Department 
uh, gives us access to Maxar, our digital globe imagery, for free uh, for humanitarian use. Uh, we also have, I guess, most NGOs have a preferential pricing scheme with other vendors, uh, Airbus notably, and then almost all of the other satellite data sets that I'm that I'm aware of are free and open source. So um, the nice thing about Google Earth Engine is that all of these um, um, catalogs of imagery are available right through the platform. So essentially, Google Earth Engine is my go-to. Does someone else want to answer? Cédric, Erwan, Clovis. A letter one on this one from our side because he is the one managing the system and all the partnership for access to to the data. So everyone. Yeah, and our case we don't use uh, high resolution uh, imageries, but on uh, only uh, global uh, imageries which uh, are free of uh, free of charge. Um, we try to to use um, for agriculture survey uh, on some area in, uh, in Niger. Um, some uh, images from Boeing giving us free of charge just for the try, but yeah. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I'm managing the <laughs> today. Uh, so we have uh, another question from Sylvie, uh, and I have a, a one quite similar also. Um, so when you don't have access to an area, we see that some sectors of intervention, agriculture, wash, infrastructure, follow-up, etc., work well with remote uh, mapping. But does this not create a sector BA? Uh, what about other sectors and what are the keys to make sure we don't ex exclude them from our action? I think from from our experience, it's it's probably important to just highlight the limitations as much as possible about what you can do with remote sensing, and that uh, typically we're often working on multi-sectoral assessments. So there are many indicators uh, at play, and what we're really looking at in terms of matching indicators to remote sensing is just a handful of indicators uh, per sector. So I think the I'm not so concerned about a bias in the sense that we're probably not looking at that much with the remote sensing in comparison to all of the, let's say, multi-sectoral indicators. Um, but I think being clear about what the gaps are, what the limitations are of, of what you are looking at with remote sensing are key to, to making sure things aren't excluded. Yeah, in, in, in the case of the pews, like we've, we, we rely on information, um, so it's not remote sensing per se, but we have relays in different areas where we don't have access to. Um, for instance, Northern Burkina Faso, where we could not go right now, and people are relaying information. Obviously, we try to increase the scope of the early warning system, not only focus on the pastoralist aspects. Um, the problem is that you will need additional, um, um, let's say, knowledge capacities and competencies from the, the network you've got in place. So this is something you can build up, um, but you have also to kind of focus on what is key um, at the moment. So the, the, the balance, the, the difficulty is to find the right balance between enlarging your system with having the largest spectrum possible and multi-sector approach but keep good quality data and keep it manageable as well. Like your capacity to treat the data that comes back to create and produce information is, um, is, a, is a key constraint as well. Um, so yes, this is um, something we have to look at and we are trying to look at um, finding the right balance between a lot of information, multi-sectoral approach and quality um, of the information that is produced and, and, and frequency of it to keep that capacity to manage the data that are collected is also a, quite a big challenge for us. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Matthew, uh, have you managed to extract individual shelters from high resolution resolutions or imagery uh, using Pictura? 
Uh, and if so, is there a workflow available uh, you follow uh, that the person would like to access? <laughs> For the for the workflow, um, there are a number of links that they prepare, uh, essentially tutorials on the Pictora uh, website, and I can I can send a link to those. Um, in terms of what we've been able to do with individual shelters, um, we've had uh, very good success recently with mapping individual shelters. Uh, however, the edge detection, so the the fine delineation of the edge of the shelter, still needs improvement. So at this point. We're very certain that we're getting the centroid point of the shelter accurately. And what we do in terms of cleanup is set essentially a minimum bounding box uh, around the resulting uh, blob that you get from, from the analysis. And this has worked quite well so far. Um, but we're, we're also seeing that Pictera, it, the application is essentially learning uh, based on every user's input. So it is improving um, quite rapidly in, in, a, in a sense. And so we've seen this improvement over time since we started using it. Thanks. Um, and then another question from uh, Flavien Rouillet. Uh, do you use drone imagery? So one of <laughs> one of you. Uh, and in what use case is it useful compared to satellite imagery? In our case, we haven't used it very often. Um, we've we've actually never gotten the authority to, to fly drones. Uh, so we it's sort of on the wish list, but until we get uh, institutional authority to, to fly them in country, it's always going to be uh, something difficult. However, in, um, in Bangladesh, we were able to get um, high resolution drone imagery of, of all of the camps. And we were able to use this to, to do very, digi very detailed digitization of shelters, uh, as well as infrastructure that you wouldn't see normally in very high resolution imagery. So, uh, small latrines were digitized, bridges, uh, things like this that would normally not be captured in satellite imagery, we were able to see and uh, digitize with, with confidence. It, was, it turned out to be a very useful data set. Yeah, uh, on drones, we do have some uh, experience. I, I haven't presented the, the, this case study, but um, basically we um, uh, we are using drone to to develop uh, auto imagery um, uh, using uh, automatic plans uh, to to address uh, a monitor some hotspot of deforestation uh, and uh, and uh, have a very um, intra annual uh, update of uh, the the land dynamics and um, agriculture um, on those are spots. So uh, we we um, we also do th those uh, mapping using drone to to verify or ground uh, trust the um, what we can obtain from um, automatic uh, detection of deforestation to and um, uh, to this aspect it, it does uh, uh, match uh, properly or, or we. For instance, uh, we have compared the uh, GLAD alerts uh, with drones, and uh, it enabled us to to to, to have um, uh, a clearer view of, of the of, of the of the plots. And um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, another case that is also it's to to uh, uh, support um, background study on on the food production. Uh, especially on certain cash crops to identify the the, the trees and and um, uh, to uh, estimate food production uh, on on the uh, village uh, and the higher uh, uh, level. Um, but uh, we are uh, clearly uh, limited from the mapping area of drones, so um, maximum hundreds of uh, hectares. Uh, so so it, it gives uh, there's some. Uh, uh, operational uh, application, but uh, we are still limited. And uh, I think uh, very high resolution imagery, uh, three meters like planets can um, also uh, provide a good information. Um, and uh, they do match uh, properly. Thanks, nothing from ACF and drone. 
No, we, we are not uh, currently using drones. The, the system we are running is um, one of its main characteristic and strength is its uh, low cost. And, 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 and running drones to, it would be, as they said, um, amazing because we could uh, like have additional information in areas where we get um, data from relays in the field. However, um, the cost to maintain this equipment, make it run on the long term for us, is not really sustainable for that specific system. It could be useful, though, for other things like um, agriculture surveillance systems that um, we are currently piloting. It's not something we've developed um, on a regional um, scale. Um, but so far, what we're aiming at is to have um, the most accurate possible system for the lower cost which for us so far also excludes the use of this type of, of um, engine and not mentioning all the, the authorization you need to, to, to use this type of equipment. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, and then we have uh, maybe two questions that can be a bit linked. Uh, so we have a, a first question from Claire Alleu, um, who's asking, how would you advise um, setting up reinforcing a ground threatening network when not having access to an area? Uh, and, and then um, have you ever uh, faced cases uh, when you decided not to use or publish an analysis due to insufficient quality and ground truthing? Okay, so, um, uh, go on, Mathieu, go. Okay, so from, from our side, I, I would say that there are many products we've decided not to publish in the end, I think, and we'll probably see that more as we try experimental applications of remote sensing, but it's usually not due to a lack of ground truthing. Uh, in our case, um, ground truthing is very difficult to implement uh, given the security context um, that we work in most, in most countries. Um, that said, in terms of setting up a network, it really depends on the, the context in country. Um, you never want to put um, staff or enumerators at risk. And so it has to be a situation in which they're, they're both comfortable and confident and safely reporting on, on something from the ground. And so ideally you want somebody physically there that can see it, that, report, that records the point. Um, however, a lot of what we do ends up relying on key informants who are familiar with the area that can relay changes in a, in a, a less specific way, let's say. Um, but something that we do need to start working on is uh, better ground truthing, for instance, of, of individual crops or agricultural areas to better parse the, the remote sensing data that we have that's lower resolution. Um, it's very difficult to, to do crop type mapping, for instance, without, without any kind of ground truthing. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to unmute. Um, yeah, so for the first question uh, about not publishing, yeah, uh, we, we've um, faced that certain difficulties in the, um, in the specific situation of the, um, the adaptation of the pews for the COVID uh, monitoring situation at pastoralist level. Um, we had, so the, the data collection was done um, on, on a frequency, uh, on a weekly frequency, on a weekly basis. And we've had some doubts about certain data. We tried to cross check with direct calls to relays in the field, but when we had no proper um, um, justification of the data that were given to us, we decided not to um, publish that type of data to make sure there was no um, um, like risk to actually um, um, take credit out of the, the system we were trying to set up. Um, so that direct link with the relays in the field was used um, quite a lot to, to correlate the data, to triangulate them and, and try to get justification for any um, specific data we had spotted that were a bit um, abnormal, let's say. Um, for the setting up and reinforcing the, the ground threatening, we, we work a lot uh, at Action Against Hunger with farmer organizations and pastoralist organizations uh, who have common interest in running that type of systems, at least for the pastoralist early warning system. And this has proved to be quite efficient. Um, we, there is a common understanding and a co common need 
with uh, civil society organizations and that contributes directly to the, the quality of the system as well and, and in, its institutionalization and, and its long-term um, existence as well. So this is um, one axis we, we, we decided to develop. Um, then we have a question from Susie Goodell, um, who is asking uh, if you can give some comments and give some example uh, of how the remote sensed uh, data and the mapping projects uh, were used and by whom. Um, so was it mainly used uh, internally within your organization for, for planning and response, or um, is it also accessible for other people or the organization in the crisis where you work? May, may I jump in again? Um, okay, so it um, the, um, the products that are um, published are used at various levels. Um, they are used at regional level in Western Africa for decision making at policy level. Um, to identify where the risks are and to um, like kind of prioritize the area of intervention in terms of pastoralist response and, and needs. Um, this is the first level. Then there is um, the, the system um, benefits from the, um, the fact that it is um, relying on the involvement of pastoralist organization themselves again. So for instance, in the, in the, the COVID context, um, the information were directly used by the farmer organization and pastoralist organization to define um, certain type of intervention and mobilize funding to actually respond um, to the, the priorities and, and emergencies that, um, that were identified. So, um, what we would like to is to develop a system that um, um, would include products directed towards pastoralists themselves, so they could take decision into like daily management of their herds and so on. This is something we have we are de currently developing using radio messages, SMS, and so on. Um, but its efficiency is quite limited so far, and um, the data that we are actually sharing. Can, could also um, trigger some difficulties. Like if we're saying, okay, water is available there, and then we could trigger some massive movements to the place where the water is available and actually create more problems than there were before. So this is still something we are struggling with. So we work uh, macro level for decision, meso level at farmer organizations, uh, but for the micro and local level and, and um, taking decision on um, practices and so on, we are still trying to um, find out um, how to fine tune the system and do something that is actually useful and um, with um, making sure that it's not going to create any, any, any problems. Yeah, I, I can add a, a bit on this question. Uh, I mean, we, we are not working uh, as much as uh, with critical uh, information um, uh, as, uh, as as you do uh, in the emergency action. <clears throat> so uh, we we uh, all the data collected and the mapping projects are are usually made available uh, to to the partners. Uh, and uh, as I presented uh, uh, the. We try to develop uh, a geoportal uh, in interface at least to 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 plug and connect to our to our database. So all not all the information are made available for sure, uh, especially regarding uh, individuals and household surveys. But at least as a part of of them uh, can be uh, um, investigated and uh, also uh, for, uh, downloaded if, if needed. So. Uh, so we, we are we're trying to to do that uh, on the course of the project and uh, and share th those information using platforms or or, or because we we uh, also have uh, teams and technicians on the field that that uh, uh, there's uh, lots of um, occasion to 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 discuss about those uh, information and and products 
and, and, and share to, because it, it definitely needs, uh, can be used uh, for, for different sectors and different manners. So it, it has to be shared uh, to, to, to increase our, our knowledge on the, on the landscapes. From, from our side, most of what we do is uh, to inform the response within the framework of the, the humanitarian coordination architecture. Um, but that said, it really the audience depends on the type of product, essentially. So if you're talking about a detailed camp map, that's going to go to a camp manager and other camp level actors. Something like a situation overview of a rapid, a rapid analysis is aimed at a different higher level audience for, for advocacy purposes, generally. Um, most of what we do ends up public on our resource center. So it is publicly available, but there are a few instances where um, there are perceived sensitivities that uh, restrict the dissemination to crisis level actors. Um, thank you. You can keep your mic on, I think, <laughs> Mathieu. Uh, there is a question for for you uh, about Iraq, so you've mentioned the loss of communication with the camp management uh, in, in Iraq, and so is there a reason? Uh, is the reason due to the specific remote sensing work? Uh, so when you told them that you will work remotely, or is it a larger and general issue? So I mean, it's it's not quite clear actually. So basically, what we as part of the adapted methodology, we've, we've gone from physical side visits to this uh, essentially call list. So we have a list of all the camp managers that we call. And unfortunately, it's not clear exactly why, but there's a, there's a small number that are just not responsive when we reach out to, to set up a, an interview with them. We don't actually have the answer in all the cases. And I imagine in some cases it might be uh, personal reasons. Um, however, it, it, we just, I just can't say at this point. It, hopefully it's something that we can rectify, but I don't think it has any, any linkage to the remote sensing work. And a last question, as we have two minutes left. Uh, from your experience, uh, what are the heaviest factors to consider in when you want to launch a remote mapping activity? HR, price, choice, choice of tools. So who wants to answer? We have two minutes left. Yeah, just just a word. I think um, um, when the identification of the need, like what is the final use of what you want to, that, that would be the heaviest factor. I mean, um, you want to launch a remote mapping activity. What is it for? Who is it? Like uh, different products are going to be directed to different type of factors and so on. If you, I would say, if you're able to define um, like properly, um, identify the objective and the need and how it should be used to actually answer to those to those needs then you're going to de derivate the, the HR the costs and the type of tools you're going to use and so on um, so I would start with the first thing the heaviest factor is probably um, uh, what why do you want to launch your remote mapping activity and then and then maybe the rest will follow but um, I think you can adapt um, HR you, you um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think I, I gave my, my, my main point on, the, on that question is just to start with what are the needs and where do you want to go? What is the objective? And then the rest will actually um, um, come, come from that and derivate from that. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot, Cédric. Um, anyway, I think we'll have to, to close the session uh, and the Q&A now. Um, so thanks a lot for to all speakers and um, in in the audience, uh, if you want to reach one of our uh, speakers, uh, don't hesitate to do it. Uh, so in the platform, you can you can find people. Um, so yeah, just just get in, in touch with them. And thanks again and enjoy the rest of the <laughs> QNG today. So thanks to all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.